Welcome to the John Bobo Experience, where we talk everything you can imagine, football. So, joined today on this ep- on this special episode. Actually, Tor, this is my first episode, like, relaunch. So, it was a little bit of a shocker, because, cool, you could do this, awesome. Hey, uh, this is Thor Nystrom. He's from uh, NBC Sports X. I'm about to say that wrong. I said I was about to say extra, but it's Edge. There you go. Thank yep. you. Thank you for adjusting the camera. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, he's a college football analyst. He's honestly one of the best in the biz. He's won some uh, awards for it and stuff. That's about when I started to get to know you a little bit was when you were winning those awards with, for the FWAA. And, I mean, you're still here. You're still doing it, man. So you're really good at what you do. Talk a little bit about your job, man. Like, what do you do, man? Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, well, I watch a lot of college football. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> you know, outside of the season, it's a natural dovetail into NFL draft season, right? You know, like, uh, you know, and a lot of this, you know, the way that I'm watching college football and the way that I cover it, it's it's sort of like predictive analytics, you know, handicapping the games and stuff like that. Well, that's a lot of what we're doing with the, you know, it's 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 a it's it's a similar pro, not the exact same process, but it's it's sort of the same thing that we're trying to do in NFL draft season with the specific prospects, trying to extrapolate them forward, make predictive, um, you know, outcome evaluations of them. So th- there's a lot of things in common, and obviously, I come into every NFL draft uh, season with a little bit of a head start just because I've been covering these guys for four or five years. I've been watching them for four or five years. Yeah. And that's exactly why I decided to get into the transfer portal this year is to get a head start on a lot of these guys, especially, you know, what was it? 1500 different athletes jumped in the transfer portal and just the FBS FCS level alone. So that's, it's a great tool to get started on the NFL draft, but, um, yeah, dude. So how did you get started doing this? Like this whole college football, how did you get into the industry a little bit? And then, you know, we'll take it from there. Yeah, I, uh, I, let's see. Well, I mean, coming out, I mean, I was always going to do sports journalism and coming out of, out of Kansas. I don't know if you can see my, <laughs> yep. my sweatshirt oh, yes. there. Um, <laughs> I I'm always wearing my rock chalk, <laughs> always repping rock chalk. But coming out of Kansas, I, I interned with MLB.com. And then that got me a job at NBC, uh, working part time doing baseball stuff. And at the same time, at the time, it was uh, Roto World, what the site was called. And uh, shout out to Roto World. And then uh, um, at the same time, I got into graduate school. And so I ended up doing the part time baseball stuff through graduate school and then a year at teaching in China. And then when I got back, um, was looking for more hours, and it just so happened that Roto World had an opening on the the college football NFL draft side, and that's that's what I've always wanted to do. I'd sort of gotten into the baseball writing by, you know, happenstance or whatever. That was the best internship, and that led to my first job out of undergrad. But uh, what I always, I mean, I played football, you know, coming up. That was always my favorite sport. Everyone who follows me on Twitter knows that I play the NCAA football games, and I have since I was oh, a little kid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and maybe we'll talk about that later on with with Mike. <laughs> Um, but you know, so, I mean, like that's, that's what I've always been interested in. And, uh, so to be able to switch to that was like really cool. Like I've, I've been pumped about that and, you know, I mean, cause that's what, what I'm obsessed with anyway, like they wouldn't, if I was still doing baseball, I'd still be doing some of the same stuff I'm doing now, handicapping the college games. And also, you know, some of the NFL draft stuff I do, it's just that I wouldn't be getting paid for it. You know, like I, I've been doing mock drafts going back to, can I swear on this? Oh, of course. I was about to say the F word. Uh, I'll, I'll say my <laughs> F word for later in the show. But I, I've been doing them going back to like, you know, I don't know, like uh, at least high school, um, maybe even like late middle school. But I, I, I remember in high school, I'd be doing them like, you know, we'd be in algebra or, you know, history class and I'd be doing my be predicting my stuff like under the. You know, you'd have like the two books, you'd have the notebook in the book and then under what you were actually reading or doing, you know, so they there wouldn't be much that the teacher could catch you on. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you'd have like the Sports Illustrated under there, you'd have the extra notebook, you know, whatever. So anyway, I, I've been doing mock drafts for a long time and I, I just love it. You know, predicting college football games, stuff like that. And you're good at it, too. That's the other thing. Like when you post stuff like you're like, oh, I hit on this parlay. Oh, I hit on that parlay. And you're just sitting there like me, I guess. I guess I'm a little bit better than average when it comes to betting because I'll usually make money on like this year. No, this year I was insane. Like I stopped betting after like week three and I was just like, yeah, fuck it. It's done. Like it's crazy. This season's just stupid, but um, you're good at it because you hit on this stuff and you're always in 
people like me sitting there going, man, that's just, it's not fair. Like how, I guess that's where your predictive stuff comes into play a little bit. Yeah. Well, I just been doing it for so long and, you know, like um, I, I was hoping to become an NFL player, but unfortunately I wasn't athletic <laughs> enough, but uh, you know, the other part of my brain was sort of like writing and math. And so, you know, I, I started um, once I went to undergrad, that was the first time I started like betting, um, you know, like with, I don't know if it was with a website or with, I think it was with a website uh, when I was, when I was 18, 19. And I remember, um, I'll never forget it. There was a, uh, um, me and a buddy at Kansas, we had decided that we wanted to go in and, and like, you know, make the sort of the same bets every single week. And, and we had found, it was like one of those things you see online or something like, you know, you pay $99 and it's like three guaranteed winners, like whatever. And so anyway, we, we, we actually did that guys. I, I guess I was a sap. And so I, I called in and the, the, the first time it was supposed to be like a parlay. Well, the parlay was, you know, he got it wrong. Right. And then, and then it was supposed to be like, you got like free picks after that for like X amount of time. Well, I called back in and I was like asking about that. And the, the person on the other end of the line ended up hanging up on me. And I, it, it was a great lesson that, that, the you know, the, uh, the touts or, or whatever, like that I was never going to do that. If I was going to keep doing this, I was going to figure out how to do it on my own. And I got my ass kicked for a while, you know, like the, the lines there, they're formed by the public, but they're, you know, they're, uh, you know, designed to get, you know, even whatever. And the, the way that the public sees it, they're, they're going to be invariably wrong more than they're right because the, the people that are winning money, it's, you know, of course the, the book is, but then the other people are, are the sharps. And so, you know, it became, eventually it just became, you do it so often, you fall on your face so much. And luckily at that point, you know, if I was betting, it, it wasn't for a ton of money, but I, I was certainly tracking my picks where, you know, you start to come up with with ideologies. You start to, you know, understand certain things about if the line is different than you expected it to be. Um, and then I developed systems for coming up with my own, uh, you know, line right out of the gate, you know, where, where I could sort of have um, um, remove my own biases, at least from the initial uh, sticker price when I'm looking at the sticker price where it's like, this is what the fair price should be. This is what the actual price is. And uh, because I cover the sport so close, I know who's going to be in and out of the game. You know, I, I know who's been, you know, if, if a team's been playing well, they've been playing poorly. If they're a team that, that skews better to playing at home or on turf, um, you know, different stuff like that. And then the conditions and stuff like that, if they, you know, if it's a run heavy team, you know, that, that has a bad pass defense, you know, that you, you can find specific matchups, stuff like that. Um, you know, and you, you get a lot more offering in college football than you do the NFL. I, mm -hmm. a lot of people that, that put out their, their picks, it's a lot of NFL stuff. I, I don't, I don't watch the NFL nearly as much as most people. I, I watch the Vikings every week and then I'll watch, you know, like I'll have the Sunday night game on in the background and I'll have the Monday night game on in the background, but that is, that's as much football as I can handle because Thor, Thor every single weekend night is watching the college, you know, if a college, if Maxion's on, yeah. right, if Mountain West game is on, if the Friday night games are on or whatever. And then of course, Saturday is, is wall to wall. So um, on Sunday for me, it's just the Vikings. And then, uh, you know, like I said, in the background when I'm I'm doing my, my other stuff, but that, that's how I've sort of gotten to this point of uh, with college football, being able to reliably hit, you know, roughly between 53 to 55% against the spread on late numbers, reliably every single season documented. Not, not me saying that document. Yeah, no, no, I know it's documented. Yeah. And then the other crazy thing that you do in the off season is you release this giant undrafted free agent chart that's like <laughs> 500 players deep, and you've got them all ranked like yep. right after the draft, like it's up, and it's like whoa, like how do you how do you go about putting that together every year? This is a great question, and it's already begun now. Like the the work I do every single day now, like in um you know, late January, early February, mid February, that's the, that's what leads to that. So like right now I could give you, John, I could give you my rough draft right now on the top. Fuck. There's my first one on my top 40 <laughs> quarterbacks, like heading into the process. I could even go a little bit deeper than that. I got, I got 49 guys in my, in my system right now, but uh, in, in my, you know, uh, chart, there's two of them that I've confirmed to retire. Uh, Jake Bentley and Zeb Nolan appear both to have taken GA jobs, but there's 49 guys that at least I have confirmed in this class. I have them, uh, uh, a rough ranking of them, you know, heading into the process. And then 
as because I, I and I could show you my spreadsheet. I I was showing some guys at the senior ball and their their eyes were like like I showed Eric at home and his eyes were like went back in his head. He's like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, uh, but like the the way that I um that that I do it better is when I can see all the data right in front of me. Um, and so you know like uh, one thing we've been blessed with we we have the PFF data at NBC and so um, I I have my different charts and. And, and, you know, I'm not allowed to publish a lot of this stuff, but I can I can break down all the quarterbacks by all their advanced analytics, you know, for instance, with PFF or or just, um, uh, you know, like uh, I've dropped back numbers by quarterbacks or let, let yeah. me go. To- let me go to the offensive line and see some of the stuff I got in here. I got uh sacks allowed last season, hits allowed, hurries allowed, pressures allowed, uh, penalties, which is how I know that that Trevor Penning, that kid that everyone's in love with, is a fucking penalty machine. The only guy. <laughs> so, so I, I have, told you that, dude. You could have figured that out watching the Senior Bowl this week, which we'll get to that. But we'll we'll get to that. Yeah, he, last he week chucked a kid into Desmond movie? Ritter's knee at one point, and, and everyone oh, in the crowd like God. you know held their breath because it's like, oh my God, Trevor Penning might have just blown out Desmond Ritter's knee. But then you know Ritter did pop up. But but I have I have a hundred and uh, I, I have almost two hundred offensive linemen in my system. Um, that Northern Iowa kid, the only guy who had as many penalties in college football last year as he did that, that is draft eligible that, you know, that, that I'm showing is draft eligible was Scott Lashley of Mississippi state. And first of all, he played in the sec. Second of all, he's a fucking stiff. That's not going to hang around in the NFL for a while. So Trevor Penning coming from the FCS and having that many penalties, it, it should be a red flag to people in, in my opinion, I, I'm a little bit lower on, on Penning than, than some people. He's an awesome run blocker and he's for sure a bully. But when that kid starts losing a rep, he, he gets frustrated and he gets fucking grabby. So no, no, I'm I'm gonna agree with you on that point too. But yeah, this is awesome stuff because like I use your your undrafted free agent thing as just like a rough idea when you drop it. Like, hey, this guy, I think I dropped last year. I did a, I had just got into Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. So that was a funny story right there. We're in Afghanistan. It's draft night. And guess what? Code red, internet gets shut down across the base because of a UAS. So I had to wait like 20 hours to get the draft results, which was really funny. But uh, <laughs> so I would have been like, I, dude, I would have been so jittery. I, I remember one year I was <laughs> priest for the NBA draft and it was a similar thing where I, I had to wait. But go on. I, I know the feeling. No, no, because it was it was like it was only the first round. Thank God it was it was nothing else like the rest of the draft I had internet and everything but the internet shut down everybody lost it we're all freaking out you know because people are watching their netflix or hbo i think one of the guys was finally going through game of thrones and we're sitting there like (laughs) like you know what the fuck just happened to the internet and we're freaking out right and so uh i'm like oh my god it's got to come back soon because this is like four hours before the draft's supposed to start i'm like i I, i'm trying to watch the draft i'm i was gonna get up it 4.30 in the morning or whatever the fucking time it was that I had to get up, you know, to watch it because you're nine and a half hours ahead in Afghanistan because there's this stupid half an hour, like, time difference. I don't understand it. I don't understand time zones, but there's a half an hour, literally. We were an hour and a half ahead of Kuwait, nine and a half hours ahead of, you know, central time. And so, yeah, I'm sitting there like, as soon as it was like two in the afternoon, the next day when I finally got it into the results and I was sitting there scrolling, Oh man, three quarterbacks in the first three picks. Oh, wow. Mac Jones, the Patriots. Well, God damn it. Y'all fucked up. You know, <laughs> but anyways, no. So, uh, I guess, uh, I, I always use your undrafted free agent guide as something to, you know, when I start working on, on stuff like, you know, post draft stuff, Hey, this is a really good pickup here. This is a really good pickup there because it's such a helpful resource. It's awesome to have, it's one of the best things that's honestly put out there after the draft. So I love that kind of stuff, man. I'm glad that you have this awesome system in place that makes that work. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, yeah, I'll have, you know, I mean like the, um, you know, I mean, at, at, at within the next couple of weeks here, I'll have a top, you know, 50, 60 for running backs, uh, top, you know, 90, hundred for wide receiver that, you know, then it's fluid, whatnot, but like, um, my process is both uh, data and then the tape viewing as well. Um, mm-hmm. And I think, you know, there's some people that go all one way or go all the other way. Um, I, you know, I like to uh, combine it a little bit, um, you know, and and I mean, that just goes along with my background, right? Like, you know, the covering yeah. it and, and then, you know, th- this sort of stuff. Um, and so I, I like to have the most data that I possibly can. Um, you know, I talk to people as well and stuff like that, get information and 
Um, that I mean, the whole goal of the thing is to you sort of. Um, uh, it, it's not a complete mirroring of a of an NFL front office because the the in fact what what we have to do is a bit harder because for an NFL. Yeah. You're looking NFL. at the entire class. They're looking at maybe 200, 250 guys at tops. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because they they only they only have position needs at a certain amount of you yeah. know places or what. I mean, some are just going to be blotted out. Some positions and you know and and then the prospects that go with them are going to be blotted out maybe the whole time or, or or at least in certain rounds. And then the other thing is, um, you know, there's schemes, right? And they're fits. Yep. You know, is it, you know, what kind of a passing system is it? And then is it, for instance, do they need a do they need an outside receiver? What kind of outside receiver? Or do they need a, a pure slot guy, et cetera? And that can help them hone in on the specific guy as well. And 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 when John's talking about you know cutting a board, you know whereas I put out a, a, a top 500, a four or 500, that the, them cutting it down to 250, it's most of that stuff. It's their taste, their need, um, and then that sort of stuff. You know where then the other guys they just they don't yeah. factor in because it, it's not going to be relevant to them. There's no need to sink resources for that team into those guys. Whereas with us, since there's no clearly defined roster that we're drafting for, there's no coaching uh, uh, staff that we're, we're, we have to cater to their system or their needs or whatever. Um, you have to do it sort of like in a way that no other NFL evaluator does. You do it like you try to do it in this sort of vacuum where it's like, you, you know, all systems equal and, and 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 just sort of like a rote uh, value evaluation, but that's why sometimes when there's a difference, like with NFL teams and and like us, that's why there can be. Like for instance, I, I was just talking. We I mentioned Mike before. Um, Mike and I were just talking on the phone a couple of days ago about like uh, one of the ways that Belichick drafts different than other dudes, and 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 uh, the the way that he uses his roster different. It's almost like a. Um, uh, a baseball manager with platoons, you know, like the Oakland A's, they got, you know, the, the, I mean, the, you know, the on base percentage shit for sure. But they also did a lot of this stuff where, you know, the, they'd have the left hander that was going against the right handed starters and then they would yep. do that, you know, vice versa, whatever. Uh, Belichick, it, it's not, the, you know, of course, the same thing because it's not handedness, but like you'll see him more take guys like um, that are, are considered antiquated uh, in the current NFL, you know, like, uh, for instance, like a big thumper of a of an inside linebacker that that isn't great in coverage, and and you know maybe folks like myself are like, oh, you know that guy's, he's a throwback that like you know, you know 30, 40 years ago he would have been you know a, a top two round pick, but now, you know in, in in today's NFL he's a dinosaur, which, it's you know speaking from the behalf of like 80 percent of teams that might be true, but Belichick you know he, he it, it's a different thing and he's willing to take for instance uh, off ball linebackers that are just uh, run stuffers because he's happy to do the the platoon thing and yank them off the field and passing downs and he's happy to you know do that sort of thing and and, and you know not only keep guys fresh in that way but uh, make sure that they're on the field uh, in, in a way that's that's playing up what their their utility is what you know playing up their strengths and and trying to mitigate their weaknesses and so that's another thing that's different too whereas some teams like um, uh, the Cardinals have sort of drafted like this in recent years where they, they want like the guy who has like all the different weapons you know like himself and he can stay on the field like Isaiah Simmons you can put them all different sort of places it's not a utility of like you know he's only going to play two downs but this is what he's really good at so you can leverage yeah. him it's like you know every single down he can be on the field and he could be in a different spot in the alignment six straight plays yeah and that's an interesting point that you bring up about Belichick too because when you look at when you look at his off-season roster, and you're going into the regular season, and it's right before you know the the final roster cuts. You're sitting there looking at it, going, "How can I cut this down to 53?" Because there's so many players that are just like I remember on the defenses last year. I think trying to figure out who was going to be on the 53 and then who's going to be on the 45, you know, week one, was like cutting through 26, 27 different different defensive players that could all be on the field. And that's just how they, when they go, you know, they're 22, 23 deep, whatever they decide to do on the defensive side, they're playing that deep the entire game. And it's wild because it's not something that's really used across the rest of the NFL. But that's a great point, too, is the difference of how people play the game, how they coach the game, how they use the players, their personnel department, et cetera. 
Yeah, I think some people see him as a as a, you know, like a better evaluator. And I'm sure there's a little bit of a part of that for sure. But I, I also think it's um, he is he has a better idea of what he is evaluating for with his within his own system. And, and mm-hmm. he's the general of the troops. So it's, you know, the utility of these guys once once they're out in battle, he's going to be the one that um, is sort of in charge of that. And so. You know, like the, the Parcells thing about like, you know, he wants to, you know, pick out the groceries when he when he's cooking or whatever. But Belichick, <laughs> is, he he's very he uses, again, the, the utility of the player. He's he's using it in such a way where it is it is most effective and he's happy to use guys as to, to use the baseball parlance as as platoon guys. So I, I think it's another important thing to to mention, because as draft evaluators, a lot of times we're going to artificially bump up guys that that we call like you know, hybrid players or like guys that, you know, they can stay on the field for X and X and X. And, you know, like for instance, running backs that, that only have like a specific utility, like, uh, you know, maybe they're a good receiver and, and and they, they pass block well, but they, they don't have any vision behind the line. They're, they're not a good, you know, meat and potatoes runner or whatever, like that, you know, whereas we might undervalue a guy like that, um, a, a, a team like the Patriots may properly value them because, the thing that we are docking them for, it is absolutely irrelevant to that team because they will never use them in that way. Exactly. And that's why, like, they cut down so far on their on their draft boards because there's so many players that they're just not going to be used in their system or doesn't fit what they're trying to do, doesn't fit what they need on the roster. And I think a lot of people, they like to give draft analysts, specifically people like you, me, people like, uh, Eric Edholm and all those guys, Jim Nagy out there, they like to give him a lot of shit all the time because they're like, well, you said this about this kind of guy and he ended up on this team. And that's just the thing is it's like, it's not always, it's, you know, the fit, the team, the scheme, it's everything. And if you don't have that, it's not going to end well for you. And we've seen that time and time again. I mean, um, shit. Um, think about, uh, Dang, I'm trying to remember where might have had a little bit too much alcohol tonight. Excuse me, sorry, because now my mind is like slipping up. I'm still catching up on my tolerance here. Um, so missing on draft picks and people coming after you and stuff. Is that part of your process, too, where you're talking with people in the league a little bit, maybe, and saying, hey, what is it that you guys are doing? What is it that you're seeing other teams doing? Um, well, I mean, like, in, in terms of, of their process, uh, I mean, yeah, you're always sort of interested in what the NFL is valuing, you know, in that moment. Um, but as far mm-hmm. as, like, as far as, like, misses in the past, if people, like, on Twitter, they want, I don't care. Um, you know, like, <laughs> I, I really don't. It, the The fact of the matter is, if, if you're going to, you know, it's like, you know, going back to, I, I guess maybe I should have been a baseball writer because I'm going to go back to another baseball metaphor. But like I, I rank 500 guys in every class. So that's sort of analogous to, to having 500 at bats in a baseball season. Um, th- those guys fail 70 percent of the time and they're considered, you know, some of the best in their profession. Like, um, you know, my my hit rate and the NFL hit rate on this thing, it, it, it's a little bit higher. But there's certainly guys that I'm going to, you know, that I'm, I've been right on. And there's certainly guys that I've been wrong on. And, um, you know, there's, you of course try to learn, you know, why you were wrong on a specific guy, you know, and, and why you might've been right on a different guy. Um, you know, what led you to be, um, high on this guy. And then you also, the lessons you learn, you don't want to go too far with them. Like for instance, in this class, I'll give you a, for instance, um, I'm a little bit more, well, a couple guys, um, uh, I'm very suspicious. I'm very, very suspicious of Derek Stingley, but the 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 guy that I was actually going to bring up was was Charles Cross. I, mm-hmm. you know, you you've seen here recently, especially with with you know, I, I mentioned the push to analytics um, these past couple of years. You see these tackles that uh, test really well, as as I expect Charles Cross to, and that have really good, you know, I, I the the stats that I tossed out before that I have in my my thing, and I also have yeah. you know the pass pro reps and the, the pass pro efficiency and the, the their, uh, a pass pro rating that, I, that I'm, you know, like, you know, me, you know, whatever. Um, the, a guy like Charles Cross, he he's going to do awesome in the testing. And then he's in all the different analytics, the data that you're going to look at 
especially from last year, he's going to look awesome because he's going to have a shit ton of pass pro reps. There's going to be very few pressures and, and all this different stuff. But I stepped in horse manure with with uh, the the kid a couple of years, uh, Dillard from from Washington State, Andre Dillard. Yeah, on the, Eagles, Eagles, the, all yeah, time great. Yeah, the, the left tackle that Leach had there, and it, it's a very similar. I'm, I'm not saying that that Cross is going to be a bust, you know, like, but it's it's a similar thing where it was a left tackle for a Leach team that was very athletic. That that on their team, uh, Leach Leach's team's invariably a system. They get the ball out quicker than, you know, than just about anybody in the nation, just just on average. But like Anthony Gordon, his his release was lightning quick, and and this. Uh, um, uh, Will Rogers at Mississippi State it, it isn't quite as fast as as um, Gordon's was, but he he you know if you look at like how quickly they get the ball out, um, Rogers this year he was in the top like you know five to ten percent of quarterbacks in the FBS in terms of the ball was out of his hand this quick. Um, right. Just you know there's a lot of the the manufactured stuff and the the funnel screens and shit like that, and um, they're not at Mississippi State they're not it's it's they're not trying to have you sit back in the pocket forever, right? Like it's, you're reading one or two different keys and then you're, you're putting your foot in the dirt and you're throwing the ball. And for a guy like Charles cross, the way that manifests is like you, you have all these pass pro reps that, that build up and, you know, people think looking at it, you know, that, Oh, you know, he he didn't give up any pressures and all this. And, you know, he had all these pass pro reps and it's going to translate to the NFL. Well, you know, it's it, it's not just that that, you know, the quarterback's getting it out quicker and, and, and different stuff like that. It's also that, for instance, in, in the Mike Leach system, um, as you probably know, they have the biggest splits in the NCAA. You know, it's like three yeah. plus feet between the linemen. That's not it's not the same in the NFL. So, like, it's a totally different thing. And you're sort of guarding for this very specific thing. And Mike Leach will very openly say that that he is absolutely willing to give, you know, like uh, sacrifice like the the muscle or the, the, you know, the, the brawlers on offensive line in order to get guys that, um, you know, have good feet in space essentially. So um, it's, you have to watch out that you're not falling into traps. Well, a long way of saying like, you, you want to learn the lessons from your past mistakes. Like, you know, I missed on Josh Rose and you try to learn from that. Um, but you also don't want to go so far as to just categorically rule out a guy like Charles Cross and just be like, he's going to bust because Andre Dillard is. Yeah, no, that's actually a really good point, too, because it's I like Charles Cross a lot just from watching the tape. I watched him. I downloaded, I think, three games of Mississippi State offense while I was on the plane ride on the way home. I was just like, I'm going to start going through this. And I watched him on the plane ride. And I was like, I like this guy a lot because, you know, he doesn't you don't see a lot of the pressures. You don't see a lot of the quarterback hurries you see. Him holding up, and but that is also a point I didn't consider. That's interesting, and that's what's kind of cool about you know having conversations like this with people is, hey, learn, man, like learn a little bit, and that's why I love interacting with people and stuff. But so one of the things I was going to bring up was I was in the Music City Bowl 2019. Now, ironically, Mississippi State played in that game against Louisville. You might remember that game. Oh, Lamar Jackson, right? Uh, no, this was after Lamar Jackson. This was, was it the- Cunningham was was okay. his first year as a starter. Uh, so this is December 31st, 2019. And um, it was Joe Moorhead's last game at Mississippi State. He walked in, took a 14 nothing lead and then blew it. Lost, I think, 43 to 25, if I recall correctly. And... You walked out of there. Everybody walked out of there with a the feeling like, yeah, this guy's about to get fired. Like, there's just a, you know, that, but you know, you've been to a few college games, you feel that buzz, you know, and it's just like undeniable. You're like, yep, you're just, you know, it's going to happen. It happened a couple of days later. But one of the guys that I was talking to there, ironically, was Mike Gorsink, the 40 yard dash guy, right? The Pittsburgh Steeler guy, uh, one of their area scouts. He's been in the league for 25 plus years and stuff, whatever. We just kind of hit it off, I guess. And so we're sitting there chatting and stuff, and he's like, yeah, he says, I want to know what you what you see on the field when you go at halftime, you know, come come find me and, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit. And so one of the guy, who was it that was, uh, there was a Mississippi State pass rusher, Chauncey Rivers. Remember Chauncey Rivers? Oh, he was a, he was a last chance you, wasn't he? I believe so, yeah. And he, yeah. 
went to Mississippi State and he kind of he had all the accolades and everything. And I was watching him from the press box going, that's a bad motherfucker right there. Like, you know, I wouldn't want to be lined up on it because he had a really good first step. And uh, so we were so he catches up with me. Gorsink does. He comes up to me right there. I think I think I Mike Golick Jr. walked away like he was calling huh. the game for ESPN. Right. So he was talking to, to Mark. And so I walked up and Mike walks away. And I'm like, all right. And he said, I said, you wanted to see me here? He's like, yeah. So what did you see? And I specifically mentioned Chauncey Rivers. I was like, this is my first game in a press box. I'm still kind of taking it in, to be honest. But like, you know, like it's a whole nother field. You can see everything. It's awesome. And I mentioned Chauncey Rivers. And he was like, yeah, so Rivers, he's like, you got to be really careful with guys like that because he's a little bit of a tweener. You don't think, I don't think he can play defensive end. I don't think he's going to fit really as an edge, as a pass rusher in a four, in a three, four. And so he was talking a little bit about that and then talked about, look at where the NFL is going with their pressure sets. Right. He was saying this in 2019 and I've watched it manifest, you know, how many defenses in the NFL can you name right now running a three, four front? A base. So three man front base. Yeah. Not the majority. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard, yeah. right? Because yeah. everybody's running four. And he was talking about this. I think Pittsburgh's still running the three man front. Uh Seattle will do it from time to time, but they're really they really like to try to stay four. They they're fluid. Detroit's fluid. There's not a lot of teams that are running this three four defense anymore. And it's because he was talking about the defensive tackles. You want two guys on the inside and they're they're going to eat up two blocks if you can get them so that you can get – because ideally you want a one-on-one with a tight end, with your defensive end. And that's what he was telling me. This is back, you know, right before the 2020 draft cycle. And I was like, you know, you've kind of got a point there. There's not – there were a lot of people that were switching over to the 4-3 that year specifically in the NFL. But um, just something like – that kind of stuff, I think, when is so fruitful when you go to these games, you go to the Senior Bowl, Shrine Bowl, Bowl games, whatever it might be, and you're just talking to people. And that's the kind of info that uh, is really awesome to take in because it's like, yeah, like I see that. And these guys are way ahead of the game. But speaking of Senior Bowl, you were there. Yeah. So top moment from the senior bowl that you had it could be a personal moment could have been an on the field moment what was that number one moment at the senior bowl this year that you're just like yeah this is my this is going to be my greatest memory from the 2022 senior bowl um <laughs> uh the, <laughs> there is definitely a few um <laughs> but it could be more than one we have three, um well let, let me say one that i that i haven't said uh uh because you know, I mean, people know what happened on the field and stuff like that. What what happens off the field is is probably funner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, everyone knows the uh, the the bar beats there, which is a lot where a lot of the NFL scouts and personnel and uh, media end up afterwards. This actually wasn't at, this didn't this specific anecdote didn't happen there. as a bar like either a block away or half a block away. I I, I forget, but um. I went there with a different, uh, uh, an NFL writer and he was like, come, you know, come here. There's a bunch of people, you know, people here, whatever. And so I, we went over there and um, um, I don't know if I should, I probably shouldn't say the name. Cause I'm going to, I'm going to preface this by saying that, um, I mean, he, the, the NFL writer and I were, uh, I mean, this is, this was pretty late in the night. So we were, we were both, um, maybe we'd had a couple, couple adult beverages by that point. And the, um, uh, we, <laughs> me, me, me and, uh, one of the other NBC guys, we went up to introduce ourselves to, um, uh, one of the guys at, at, at this new bar, uh, a national, uh, uh, a national, uh, how would I say it? Like a national television, uh, NFL reporter guy. Okay. Yep. And so, you know, I, I'd never met him before. And so I wanted to, and I, you know, I wanted to introduce myself and, um, and so I, you know, we went up and, and, and the other NBC guy shook his hand and then, you know, I, 
you know, I step forward and I, you know, Thorne Ice from Nice to Meet You. And and he before before I could even like, you know, say my name, he he interrupts me and he and he is this guy, I'm not gonna say his name, just very clearly drunk, but you all would know who this guy is if if you do, you know. <laughs> uh, and and he looks at me and he goes, You're Seth Rogan. <laughs> 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 and it was like, like I was like, kind of, I was vaguely nervous to meet him, you know. And then he just like was like, you know, Seth Rogen, and he was just like, you know, I, you usually interact with this fellow on TV and see him on TV, and the fact that I didn't know if he was accusing me of being Seth Rogen or he thought I was Seth Rogen, you know, like, but I was happy to be Seth Rogen in that moment. I was like, yeah, you know. Yeah, I'm Seth Rogen. <laughs> nice to meet you. You know, like, <laughs> like you want to ride the Pineapple Express, but no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> anyway, th there was a lot of different moments that were uh, memorable and funny, and uh, you know, and then the the whole week just in general, you're you just learn all kinds of stuff. You know, that if you're talking on the field, it was what Malik Willis did in the downpour on Wednesday. You know the. Yeah. The, the 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 conditions there the other quarterbacks really struggle with it like Kenny Pickett I'm not gonna it's not because of I don't think I'm not gonna blame his hand the hand thing is stupid but um, what's not stupid what actually is real is that Kenny Pickett has middling arm strength I, I think is yes. is you know like it, it's you know Kirk Cousins at the absolute best um, or like uh, um, Andy Dalton you know and it's you know before this Andy Dalton. Uh, you know, it, like, you know, that's what he's going to be at his absolute ceiling. If, you know, if he's somehow lucky enough to hit it, um, if he's not, um, uh, then it's going to be even, you know, but, but like people expecting, you know, if he, if, in, if, if Kenny Pickett ends up going in the top 10, expecting him to be like a, a big time star, you know, like if, if you consider Kirk Cousins now a star, um, then you're hoping that that's what Kenny Pickett's going to be. He ain't going to be better than that. And in those elements, you saw that that his middling arm strength had played down, you know, and and the velocity was affected, the touch was affected, um, accuracy was affected. Um, whereas Malik Willis, um, it was like he was the only one that wasn't playing in in rain. You know, Paul was just shooting. You, up. In in terms of arm strength, I think you're right on. That's a good comp, Kirk Cousins for uh, Kenny Pickett. But I think the issue with Cousins, and I mean, you're a Vikings fan, you're watching the games every week, you can tell me that I'm fucking wrong, right? Like, that's perfectly acceptable you're fucking in this wrong, case, because good. you're definitely <laughs> you're definitely more the expert here than I am, but when I watch Cousins, I think for, he's really sound when the play is in structure, and as soon as the play gets out of structure and he's forced to improvise, that's where Kirk Cousins is not a good quarterback. Yeah, because I think that's fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you watch him at times, you know, like they'll get up 14, uh, 21, 28 points even at times. And then you'll watch that lead go away because, you know, they make some sort of adjustment to get pressure on him, condense the pocket better. He's not really capable of working outside of the pocket, I don't think, at least effectively. So maybe that's – I think Kenny Pickett's better in that regard. So maybe a slightly ver better version of Kirk Cousins because I've seen what Kenny Pickett can do improvising. I mean, the fake slide is what everyone's going to remember <laughs> him for. Yeah. But legend. Which right, which is now illegal, right? But yeah. whatever. Um. But like he, him working outside the pocket, specifically in the red zone, and just opening passing lanes and making throws on the move and stuff. That's something that I think he does really well. And so I'm not sitting here saying I'm not selling Kenny Pickett first round. Like, no, like I'm not on that train. But I, if he goes first round, I will understand it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, certainly can see that. Um, you know, I, I think if you're going to do that, you're, you know, it's sort of like buying stocks. Like some stocks, you know, there's a bigger band and they can go higher, but you have to accept a little bit more risk. And I think the Kenny Pickett stock, uh, you know, I, it's not, uh, I think there's a pretty good chance you're going to get a guy who's going to start, um, uh, a solid amount of games. Cause I think his, his skill set it does translate. It's just that, um, for, you know, for me, I, I think the, you know, I, I think it's always going to be replaceable. I, I don't see like, he's not as, he's definitely not as good as Mac Jones, you know, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, you put those two together, uh, 
you know, where does that put you like in a normal year? I, I think Kenny Pickett this this season, he's going to get inflated a bit because it's a down quarterback season, but uh, down quarterback class. But for me, that's that's why I want Malik Willis, um, because he's the one guy in this class that doesn't have any sure things that has a ceiling where if it hits, he is a potentially unstoppable uh, offensive player. You know, it's his athleticism. It's some combination of Lamar Jackson speed and, and Jalen Hurts power as a runner. And you have you have arm strength that the only guy in the NFL that I'm pretty confident could beat Malik Willis in a in a throwing velocity and, and length competition. It's Josh Allen. I'm not sure that I that any other guy that I, I would bet on him over Malik. Malik Willis has just it's beyond the arm talent. Yeah. yeah, it's it's beyond a can. It, it's like um, it's like four level arm talent. It, yeah, exactly. It's, <laughs> I was going to say Araldis Chapman, you know, like when uh, fuck, I'm using another baseball metaphor. But um, <laughs> but like when Araldis Chapman came up, like, you know, people were like, oh, there's this guy in Cuba that, you know, throws 104 miles an hour. And you're like, you're like, that's bullshit. No fucking way. And then, like, you see the guy, and it's like, oh, my God. Like, you know, it's like he's like a true pitching machine, and he can, like, go way back. And and then it's not only that. Like, he doesn't have any joints in his shoulders. It's like everything is fast twitch up there. You know, his whole arm is, like, fast twitch. And, like, so it's like a fucking slingshot watching him, like, when he's back with the Reds. And that's what it's like with Malik Willis. Every – he's, he's – there's so few guys in the history of the NFL at quarterback that you can say this about, but he is extremely twitched up in his lower half and he is extremely twitched up in his upper half. There's mm-hmm. again, just so like I, I would describe Kyler Murray that way. Um, I think I would describe Lamar Jackson that way. I would definitely describe Michael Vick that way. The list you are already running short on that list, son. You are already. Well, very that was somebody up. I was going to bring up on Malik Willis because when I watch him, I'm legit getting Michael Vick vibes because that's what Michael Vick could do. He had that crazy escape ability. He had that crazy athleticism. He had the power ability with his running, and he was already a demon when it came to speed. And then the arm talent. Like, he wasn't – like, Michael Vick had a horrible rookie season. And the reason that was because he could draw accurately, right? Like, that was the whole deal with him. And that was something that he had to grow into. So, yeah, that's that's – I, is it fair to say that's Malik Willis's ceiling? Is Michael Vick? I well, yeah, I'm. Yes, I I think so. I mean, like you, um, I I was saying this earlier on a on a different show, but um, I I don't mean it um, um in a, in a way that's um it's going to sound like hyperbole, but it's absolutely not. Like there are plays that I saw Malik Willis make, it, you know, at Liberty that I. I haven't seen another prospect make, you know, like there's one play against Virginia tech, that play where he, he goes out to the right and a guy hits him and he bounces off and he pirouettes around. And then all of a sudden he just sees a dude like 55 yards downfield and he just throws this missile and, and, and hits this and and the guy catches it right before he goes out of bounds. Like he just drops it in this bucket. Like, I I mean, the whole thing was incredible. Just an incredible feat of athleticism of, body control of vision and then of just absurd arm talent. And that's a throw that I I don't, Josh Allen, he's the only guy that I could think that could even possibly make that throw on the run to your right, where you drop a ball in a fucking bucket, like from a helicopter above the fucking stadium, like, like that on the move. Like it's just, it's stupid accuracy. And so, yeah, I mean like, you know, people are like, Oh, you know, you know, the accuracy thing. Yeah. It's within structure. Um, there's, there's things that he has not done in his life nearly as many times as Kenny Pickett, for instance, you know, Kenny Pickett, um, um, you know, call it luck or else I'm, I'm going to say it the other way. Malik Willis had dumb shit coaches earlier in his career. There's no, absolutely no reason that Malik Willis should have been behind Bo Nix earlier in his career. And if he had not, we would have gotten three, four years of, of, of Malik Willis starring at Auburn take, you know, being, being the boogeyman in Nick, Nick Saban's closet, you know, and stuff and playing around legitimate NFL talent. I mean, my God, you talk about a guy that, you know, or a team befitting for his skill set. 
he had fucking Anthony Schwartz on that team, you know, the fastest guy in college football. And then if if you want to you want to send a guy way back, now you got to worry about Malik running the 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 coterie of running backs they had at Auburn. Seth Williams in the intermediate area, you know, and he could also make plays downfield. I mean that Gus yeah, Malzahn, yeah, you, it, you can't you can't touch that royalty when it comes to Pat Nix at Auburn. I mean, 12 and 0 season, right? 12 and 0 season beat Alabama. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, <laughs> it, it, it definitely seemed like, well, yeah, I mean, it, it, let's just say if it was only down to their aptitude of playing the position and scaring the defense that um, I don't think Bo Nix would have been starting over uh, Malik Willis ever. Um, and, and, you know, Malik Willis had to make the change that he made. This isn't revisionist history, by the way. If you go back and you watch the spring spring game tape where Malik Willis is at Auburn. Malik Willis shined out he's, he he's makes some plays where it's like what the fuck was that you know because it, it, it's also this guy who's buried on the depth chart and it's like wait what like like holy shit plays and and so it, it was kind of weird you know like uh you know when he left there it's like you didn't know what what was going on there because you saw some plays in the spring game where it's just like you saw some throws where it's like that. That's fucking stupid. That's that was a st- absolutely stupid throw. And, and, and you know the guy's Malzahn. got athleticism. Yeah. This is, Malzahn, his entire Gus Malzahn was the head coach at Auburn at the time. You've seen this over and over again. He just mismanages that roster. How many? How many players have left Auburn and just done incredible things outside of Auburn when they when from under that Gus Malzahn system, whether they were grad transfers before you had this transfer crazy portal nonsense to just now, you know, like that's his, that's, that's, he has mismanaged his roster his entire career. Like that's just why he left. A lot. That's why he lost his job at Auburn, you know, because you can't be mismanaging your roster that badly every year. And be coaching against Nick Saban in your I need to win game, you know, so. I totally agree. Yeah, I, you know, I, yes, if, if he had sort of uh, Malik Willis over, over Bo Nix, uh, Gus Malzahn would still be the coach at Auburn. Uh, UCF would have a different coach right now than, than they, you know, they're yeah. different paths would, and, and the, the joke I made on Twitter is we would not know the name Brian, Har- or at least Auburn fans would not know the name Brian Harson or, um, well, I, I'm not what allowed. Was it? Whatever the chick's name was. I, I'm yeah. not allowed to say that. I'm not. We're apparently not allowed to say that. We're, we're apparently not allowed to know that information because that makes you <laughs> yada yada. Like having read the report, it, it it makes you complicit in some way. Like okay, um, but anyway, I mean Auburn fans would never know those names. Um, it, you know if if, if Melzahn had just started Malik Willis, but um, you know, and you talk about a a, a, a rich man's Nick Marshall. So, so or if, a, we, if know, we can't, if we can't, I'm sorry, if we can't say yeah. her name. We can we can comment on the level of hotness, right? Like just like straight up, like, yeah, okay, I might lose my job over that woman. <laughs> um, I'm gonna keep my job, you know. For, I mean, like <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah, um, you know, I'm I'm sure she was, uh, um, you know, I'm sure she was a, a great conversationalist for uh, for Brian, you know, after hours, you know, going over the recruiting board and, and, and such, <laughs> such like that. I would just say in the future, you know, things that I've heard is. Um, it, you know, it, I mean, just just a note for future coaches, if you're going to leave a university and go up, you know, you're going to go across the country, you're going to go up to the SEC, for instance. Um, just a, a suggestion that I've heard. This is not my suggestion. It's just suggestions from other folks. You know, one idea has been maybe don't don't take someone off the cheerleading squad from the year before at your former job and bring them across the country and name them this a prominent role within you know, your football administration, um, I, you, you probably save yourself a lot of um, consternation as far as that went. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. No, I, I thought the story was really funny, honestly, when it broke, when I was like, yeah, this is, this is, this is some it's really, really bizarre. Stuff. And, and his wife the whole time was, was anyway, a really, a really bizarre story. But the, the, the whole point of it being is if Mel Zahn had just merely done what he ought to have done, we wouldn't know of any, you know, I mean, like that would have stayed in Boise, uh, whatever the F that is, would have stayed in Boise. 
I'm sure most people in Alabama wish that, you know, in fact, I, I know because I, I talked to a lot of them senior bowl week. They wish that, it, you know, that he had never come there. Um, yeah. And all it would have taken is it was Gus Malzahn starting uh, Malik Willis. And I think there's a lesson to learn there, uh, which is you hear a lot of people this draft process already being like, oh, you know, Malik Willis is too raw and, you know, yada, yada. And you're going to you risk your job on that. Um, well, uh, Gus Malzahn, by not uh, picking Malik Willis, he not only risked his job, he lost that. And the, the the presumption there that he went on was that Malik Willis was too raw to play. Um, it's a it's a buyer beware, a decider beware sort of a thing. If you pass on Malik Willis, you're you're putting your job up, whether you you want to acknowledge that or not, because if he hits, you're getting fired. So I know that Malik Willis is like your draft crush in this cycle. Like he's okay. probably, if he could be, he would be your number one prospect, a hundred percent. Like over on the class. Well, quarterback for sure, but for sure, quarterback. Imagine. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he's he's my quarterback one. Um, and also I'll say this: if I needed a quarterback and I was picking one. I don't see any reason why he shouldn't be the number one guy. It, it, you know, for Jacksonville, of course, no, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you know, I, I mock Jacksonville, Evan Neal. There's, you know, I'm not mocking a quarterback in that spot. But um, again, uh, Malik Willis is the only guy in this class that has unstoppable tools at quarterback, and he absolutely has them. He has he has tools that they're beyond any like it's beyond shit that you've seen in recent years. Like Lawrence was football, Jesus, et cetera. But like, he didn't have the tools that just the, the pure athletic tools and, and the arm that Malik Willis does. And some of the, you know, other stuff. Um, if you want to roll the dice, why not go big or go home? Cause again, if Malik Willis hits, you're, you're talking about a guy who absolutely is a top five quarterback in the NFL, which means he's a top five player in the NFL you know, a value added proposition, um, that guy hits by year three, you're rolling, you're, you're in your Super Bowl window at least. Right. Um, so, I mean, you know, and if he doesn't hit, um, well, at least he could Malik Willis would be, I mean, if he was, you know, I, I said this on a different, uh, show, but like if tomorrow he tore both of his rotator cuffs in such a way, like could never throw a football again, he would, he would still be drafted in this class as one of the <laughs> running backs. Like yeah. if you just look at him as a running back, you have to put him damn near the top of the class. He's six foot two twenty five, which means he has a better build than almost all of them. He ran a four three seven at Auburn as a sophomore. He may even be faster now, right? Um and you see the power on tape. You also see the vision. Um like he could also be a kick returner on a punt return easily. Like you've seen it at the senior bowl the one time, like, I mean, if Malik Willis wanted, he could get out of the pocket a lot more than he does. Um, yeah. you know, so I, actually, I actually I mean, think he tries to play quarterback. Yeah. Yeah. So some people are like, Oh, you know, he, you know, he runs a lot, but it's like, if I was Malik Willis and I played behind that dog shit offensive line, he played at, at Liberty and I played with those, I'm sorry, but no talent running backs and receivers. Mm -hmm. I would have been, if I'm Malik Willis, I've been fucking running a lot more than, than he ended up Excuse running. Excuse me. I, I rolled with DJ Stubbs on my fantasy team in your league. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. J Joshua Mack, he had some runs. I mean, a lot of these guys that got stats because of Malik or whatever, but I, I think he had a lot, a lot of discretion. And that goes, you know, I mean, like, in some ways, I was like Lamar when people, you know, when Lamar came out, I was like, oh, he's a, just a runner, you know, the Bill Pauling shit. But it's like. Actually, at Louisville, they run the Earhart Perkins system, which is the same fucking system that Tom Brady runs with the Patriots. So, I mean, it's, yeah. um, you know, I, it just is what it is, you know, I, you know, and, and so as far as like with Malik, um, you know, again, like j just the thing of like what it can become um, and, and what that for your franchise, if if he hits, let's say it's a, even, you know, if it's it's 40 percent chance, even if it's a 40 percent chance, um it's it, the juice almost becomes worth the squeeze because on that 40% chance, you are going to be a Super Bowl contender for the next fucking X years. You're going to have a, a weapon that the NFL hasn't had to defend before. It, it's Lamar Jackson with power and more arm strength. Good luck. So where would you, where would you think he would fit the best out of the teams in this class? I know you just did your first mock draft. Where, 
what teams does he fit, you know, where they need a quarterback now and he could give that to them? Well, so, I mean, uh, the, the thing that you said at the end there, that's the one thing that I, I would hedge against is if I was – I think his best fit is a team that has a starter right now that is it's only a one year thing. So like mm-hmm. for instance, Detroit, I, I think would be a great fit. And I think it's a team that might like him, by the way. Um, and I think Mark Brunel might have said so at the senior ball. Uh, but anyway, I, I mean they're one team because they got Goff for one year and you could bring him, you know, sort of it'd be sort of like Malik and um or I'm sorry, sort of like Lamar Jackson and Joe Flacco, for instance. Yeah, you know, yeah like, same sort of okay. You know, you could have you could have the packages initially, and if Malik showed anything as a pat at all, um, he, you know, by the end of the season he could be starting because his legs are such a value added proposition. The same way the Lamar, I mean, Lamar led them to the playoffs that year, you know, and and, and uh, that's a real thing, right? You know, I mean, like the value added there because, um, you know, there's two ways to acquire yards. It, it, it's not just one, and you know, I mean, you know, again, that's it's it's a very real thing. So so that would be one team, yeah. Atlanta. It is, is another one uh, with Matt Ryan. Um, I, I think that's a perfect fit. Malik Willis has talked about how, like, ever since he was a kid, he wanted to be a Falcon. We talked about the Michael Vick shit. Like, um, I, I just think that that would – I wrote this in my mock chat, but I that, – that for me, that's one of the most perfect uh, fits between players and, and cities. And I've been feeling like a sort of like a, a spidey sense about it, you know, like um, – you know, even, you know, coming into the draft process and stuff. And I, I try to guard it because um, I was actually in the stadium when uh, Michael Vick, uh, when he played the Vikings, I, I was at this game with my dad. Um, when Michael Vick, like from the 45 yard line or whatever, it was in overtime against the Vikings in the Metrodome. And he, he broke free and he he ran for a fucking touchdown, like, like literally 45 yard, like walk off touchdown scramble. And I did like before, you know, Vic was, was even like, he's still 20 yards away. My dad's yeah. like grabbed by the shirt and being like, let's go. And, you know, trying to pull me towards the the exit or whatever. Um, and so, but you know, the, the thing between Vic and, and Willis, the, the points well taken, I, you know, I, 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 I sort of think that Malik Willis is just a more fortified, uh, powerful running version of, Michael Vick, I, I I've seen this movie before, and I I do not think he will bust. I he does not need to be the pers- people need to realize this shit too. There's a different threshold for Drew Brees having to be a precise passer, or Tom Brady need to be a pre- yeah. precise passer against Lamar Jackson or Malik Willis because they're bringing all this other value first off with their legs just period overtly, you know, as as a thing that can acquire yards on its own. But the other thing is the threat of it. It, it it buys you so much spacing, you know, just like in a, a basketball game with like LeBron James when he starts to, to slash and the spacing that that gives for his three point shooters around him. You have to play off. You have to, you know, go in and collapse the defense on yeah. LeBron the same way where if, if Malik is out of the pocket, th- that's the most terrified you can be as a as a defensive coordinator and, and as a defender on the field. You have to you have to account for it. If you do not, he is going to steal 50 yards from you like that. It, turn around and blink your fucking eye and 50 yards is going to be gone. So you have to account for it, but accounting for it creates spacing for his teammates. It, again, it doesn't have to be precision every single time. It doesn't need to be within structure. There's so much that is created by his legs, just again, overt value or else the, the value that it, that it brings by, by spacing, you know, for his teammates. So does Detroit pass on Aiden Hutchinson at two, if they stay there? Because to me, Hutchinson is the perfect fit for that, for just that entire ordeal. Dan Campbell type player, hometown kid. It just makes all the sense in the world. Is there any chance that they pass on Aiden Hutchinson at two? I think there is, sure. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, th- well, first off, there's, I mean, Jacksonville could take them, right? Like, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff up in the air. But, um, you know, in my first mock, I, I did put Aiden Hutchinson with uh, Detroit. There's a lot of stuff that makes sense there. And I think you can for sure make the argument that he's a better player and a better prospect than, than Thibodeau. But yeah, I think you can also make the the argument that, that Thibodeau is a better prospect. So, um, you know, and of course, Detroit could just, you know, totally go the other way and go with the quarterback Malik Willis. And I'm, I, I think yeah. that they, like I said, that they like Malik Willis. So, I, yeah, th- th- these are questions that are still for sure way up in the air. They're, they have not been answered yet. We have a lot of time left. And this is this is a cool draft because they're uh, even at the top. Um, there's no um, 
set in stone things like we've seen in previous classes. Yeah, and that's what really makes us so open right now is the fact that, like, who's going number one? Like, when was the last? What was the last draft we didn't know who was going number one? It's been a while since that. Like going into that night, it, it's been a long time since it's we been a surprise. Maybe who, say 2013, so, the Chiefs were picking number one. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. And it was who was it that went number one? It was uh, Eric Fisher. Fisher. Yeah. yeah. What a pick, Central Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> Chips up. So I guess last question before, because we're coming up here on an hour. I think you said 40, but so we're way over that. But um, last question before we go ahead and close out is just coming out of the Senior Bowl. You've mentioned Malik Willis. You talked a little bit about Penning as somebody you're not as high on. But who was it down there that you walked into a complete and utter surprise? Because I know that there was somebody there for you that you were just like, who is this guy? You were looking him up. You were doing, you started digging into the tape. As soon as you got back home, you were like, I didn't know who this guy was and I need to know everything about him now. Uh, well, th- not complete from zero to 60, but the two guys where they, they opened my eyes the most where it was like, I have to go back and, and rewatch them um, immediately. It, on the offensive side of the ball, I would say Christian Watson from NDSU. Um, what I knew about him was that he had a very good frame, you know, this, it's like the six, four, a little over 200 and that he could, that he's very fast. Yeah. Right. You know, that he was a guy that could take the top off. Cause when you watch the Trey Lance stuff, he was always on the other side of it. And I'm very close to NDSU here in Minneapolis. And, uh, maybe I have too many NDSU Homer friends. And so anytime NDSU has any <laughs> promising kids whatsoever, I'm here, I hear about it years in advance, you know, and they're you got to watch this guy. You got to watch this guy. So I, I knew plenty about Christian Watson. Um, what I didn't know as much, what he yeah. opened my eyes with in Mobile was, um, I, I knew in theory that he was a good blocker and he gave effort as a blocker, but in, to see it in person um, was a cool thing. Like he doesn't quit on a play. And it's, it's not just that he doesn't quit on a play. He, it, 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 it's more accurate to say he goes a hundred miles an hour on every play. You know, I mean, he's, he's down, he's downfield acting as a lead envoy, uh, you know, if, if, if the, the, you know, a long run is, is broken up on his side or invariably, um, you know, he has sealed his guy off to the sideline. He, he's a very good run blocker. The other thing was his work in the intermediate area of the field, you know, like um, um, in practice, what you, who you saw with was Kenny Pickett a lot, um, you know, Pickett wasn't, I mentioned this before, he wasn't like, um, you know, trying to show off the arm at all for this, you know, wasn't trying to push it too much, but he was working the intermediate area. And that, if there was one area where Kenny Pickett was doing okay, that's where it was. And Christian Watson was on the other side of a lot of those throws. Um, that's not something that he got to do as much at NDSU, you know? Um, the, and the other thing was, and we saw a bit of this at NDSU, but I didn't get to see it as much because I, I didn't get to watch every single game live, but the, the shit out of the backfield, you know, like there's, mm-hmm. there's some, He's a different. He, he's a much different kind of a player than, than, for instance, like a Debo Samuel. He's a different kind of body type. But at NDSU, they were starting to do similar stuff with him when they hadn't done stuff like that with previous uh, wide receivers, right? Like you know, they, they have a different kind of a run game that was more centered around uh, specifically their running backs. Christian Watson, they they would bring him into the backfield and they started to do some of that 49er type stuff with him. You saw some of that stuff uh, at the Senior Bowl as well. Uh, end arounds for sure, but also just, you know, putting him in the backfield. I think Christian Watson is a much more dynamic, diverse uh, sort of wide receiver and player overall um, than, than at least I was given credit for coming in. I, I, again, I, I knew that the, the deep stuff, um, I was talking to someone coming into the event and we actually talked about Christian Watson before even the first practice. And he had said something like, um, you know, he he's the prototype Packer receiver you know, that the long outside guy that can get down field. So we knew that, but it, um, coming out of the senior bowl now, th- there's a real uh, confidence that he, can, that he is not, not that he can become more than that, that he is more than that. Um, and then the other guy I would say on defense, it was Perry on Winfrey. Um, Perry on like, you know, he had some flash yeah. plays in college, for her, um, but like, you know, you're wondering about his projection and stuff like that. And every single play, you know, how is he going to hold up stuff like that? Is he, can he be that disruptive? And at the senior ball, he was just, I think I called it a nuclear reactor of energy. He he just, 
Uh, he was always pushing the pocket, um, you know, in one-on-one -on -one drills, uh, nobody wanted to draw him. It was that kind of a thing. He was just licking everyone. When it went into team drills, they had to put two guys on him or else he was just blowing up the reps, you know, or it was just over right away. Cause he was just the, the interior penetration was such like that. He was just destroying people. He was just too quick. He was too powerful. He's too crafty, everything like that. And so I, I'm a lot more bullish on Perry on Winfrey uh, probably than I was coming into the week. The other thing I really liked about him was speaking to the energy thing. It wasn't just like a, a physical thing. It was also that, you know, he, he's one of those, he woofs and stuff like that, you know, but it, it's not just like showing up uh, the opponents. Like he, he's a guy that, uh, that he, his teammates really feed off of his energy as well. And that's something you can see on the field. Yeah. So you talked about Mike joining us tonight. <clears throat> Mike was able to get on. He's on right oh, now, okay. but Hey, so okay. Mike joining us now it's Mike uh, Hughesman, right? Is that, that's how I would say that. Yes. Because that's the correct. first time yep. I believe that we're actually talking outside of just text interaction. So that is yes, that's true. Mike Mike just joined the website at uh, Football Sapient, and he's already put out some really phenomenal college football work. And you guys go way back. In fact, it was Thor sent me a message. He's like, "Hey, hire this guy. I know you guys are hiring. If he reaches out, you need to bring him on." That was obviously not something that I've regretted at all. So, Thor, you wanted to say a few things about Mike, so I'm just going to go ahead and let you take over, and we'll take it from there. Well, it's funny you said this is the first time you were actually talking to him in real life, because it's the first time that we've ever talked on a podcast, ain't it? It is. The very first, yep. Yeah, we never talked on one of these before. But no, like, my, uh, I, I mentioned this on, uh, on Twitter on a different show, I, I forget, but... Um, uh, Mike, Mike's the reason I even got into the NCAA football games in the first place. Like he, Mike, you were the first guy playing them at like our, I mean, it wasn't high school. This is going back to, I mean, middle school, right? Like, oh yeah. D yeah. D when did we, we start, when did we start doing dinos? Like, probably 96, 97. I mean, yeah, it was. Yeah. We've been doing dinos. We've been doing dinos forever. Who's and I, I yeah. you know, he, we call him, I, I'm going to call him those because that's just what I call him. But anyway, he and I, like, we got inside jokes now 20 years later about dinos that we did. Like, who's, who is who is the guy from Oregon that, that recruit from Oregon? Barry Barry, greatest name Barry ever. Barry. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. The first name was oh, B-A-R-R-Y, yeah. and the last name was B-E-R-R-Y. Like, we still, that guy's a legend, Barry Barry. Like, we'll never forget that yeah, guy. Great name. Like, yeah. 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 But, like, yeah, Huseman, Huseman's, Huseman's the real deal. He's, he, he, he didn't go into journalism like I did, but he's, he is absolutely just as obsessed with the game. And he was an FCS uh, a GA at Northwestern State in, uh, in Louisiana. And, you know, he, he was in on, on, on some recruitment and, and different stuff like that. He's, he's, he's been even closer to the game from a coaching side than I have. So I, I, you know, he'd been talking for years about doing, you know, writing stuff or doing a podcast. And I thought, it, I thought it'd be a, a, a good opportunity. So I, I, I hope that uh, people that come onto your site, check out his shit. Cause it's, it, it's going to be good. I, I talk to this guy every fucking day about, about transfer portal shit. We, we have multiple, right. Who's we have multiple calls. Yeah. Yep. About the transfer portal. I, I, just, I, had to, I had to call you today to tell you that um, Jalen Lai, one of the recent guys on my, one of the articles I put out, committed today, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. And, and last night it was, uh, yep. you were telling me the JT, the newest JT Daniel shit. Oh, yep. Yep. Right. Or was that this morning? I forget. But it was. It no, was, that was last it, night. I was leaving my night class. Yep. Oh, yeah. The the JT Daniels wasn't. And, and, he, who's and I postulated about this earlier in the process that um, if you're JT Daniels and you you uh, I well you said I can swear on this I, I don't know if this is a bad word right. or not but, but he, he just got cucked at Georgia by Stetson Bennett and it's like your worst case scenario is that you transfer too early and you get cucked at your new school whether by a guy transferring in after you or whether you know by a different guy because you committed too early you know a guy that's already there maybe he beats you out like Stetson did at Georgia so if you're if you're JT Daniels, why not wait till the summer? Um, he's when I talked about that, and I, early in the process, it looked like maybe Colorado State was leading on him, and that that was interesting in and of itself, you know, because obviously Norvell, um, he doesn't 
I think Centeno is leaving Colorado State, and and Centeno sucked anyway. And so it's like they definitely need a quarterback. It's a throw, you know, it's a downfield throwing system, and JT Daniels there would be a great fit. But it's like JT Daniels, he ain't going to do worse than that. Um, he could do better than that. Who's who are some of the other teams that we had tossed out that could be in on JT? Uh, Florida State, Mizzou, West Virginia, which is one I I think is not a bad fit. Well, West Virginia um, would be good. Yeah. yeah. Who else too? Yeah. Notre Dame. Uh, Notre Dame. I don't think LSU will be. I might have put them on the list. I don't think they're going to be in the game anymore. But depending on what happens with Miles Brennan, we don't really know what they're looking at right now. Um, and I, I'm not a Mizzou guy. I hope he doesn't go there. But it is a fit. Drinkwitz needs a guy. Yep. <laughs> 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 yeah, but and they got they got Baslack right at, at Mizzou, so he'd have to go up against well, Baslack. No, 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 no. Baslack. He's he's at, he went to he's Indiana. Indiana. Yep. Yeah, that's Indiana, right. And because no. because he 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 felt like he was going to get cucked by Tyler Cook, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, but Daniels, he could, the, he could he could he could beat out Tyler Cook. Yeah, I would think so. And the interesting Daniels one, you know, you mentioned Colorado State first, um, is that, you know, he's a modern day guy, one of the biggest, you know, high. We lost sound on Mike again. Wait, he's been. What was. Wait, your sound went off. Check the that... AirPods. Oh, they, they, yeah, you're no, you're good. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, we, we, you cut out when you started that. Okay. So, um, what I was saying is Norvell hired the modern day coach to be his running backs coach at Colorado state. So that gives a more likelihood that Daniels would go there. And who is the, the wide receiver for modern day too. That's this still lingering in the transfer portal. And I, yeah. And I include, I also said that with, um, yeah, Brew McCoy left USC. He's another guy that is a modern day. Oh. That could be the case for. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, certainly don't know that they're going to be a package deal, but it's 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 definitely something to keep an eye on. You know, absolutely. Yeah. See, this is this is what's so much fun. Hold uh, on, I just I just lost audio on you guys now. It's <laughs> <laughs> this, folks. This is Hughesman's first podcast. You have to you'll have to forgive him. <laughs> what? It was going good, and that Thor, you'll enjoy it. It was going well. Then Claybo tries to call me mid call. Oh, did yeah. he? Uh, Claybo, he's a he was our high school quarterback actually yeah. back at in high school. Yeah, that's funny. Great stuff. See, this is what's so awesome about like you know just like football, the family, yeah. the things that we create, the connections. But that's awesome, dude. And so the uh, just so you know, I think Thor, I told you and John, you probably saw it on the website. But the next one position wise coming out is um best O lineman, D lineman in the portal. Yeah. So which they're probably the two lightest position groups. There's not a lot of big names, um, top guys out there, but I want to cover all the positions. So now the, the top guys that were, I remember an offensive line, there was that kid out of BYU. Yep. He was, he's a big, he's he going big to BYU. Chief. Going to be, that's right. He left yep. Oregon, right? Yeah. He was at Oregon. Yeah. And then the, yep. the other big one was Ola Watimi, the center from Virginia. He's going to Michigan. Oh, Michigan. Yeah. That kid's a stun. Yeah. But outside act, of that, it was like it was like, yeah, this is a clone copy, clone copy, clone copy. Every, like every time a new guy would announce he's going in, I was like, yep, clone copy, yep, clone copy, clone yep. copy. I was sitting there putting fours and fives on him, like that's all it is, you know, it's not a big deal. Yeah, we we, we love the transfer portal. Mike, Mike and I are big fans of the transfer portal. Like every day, we we have conversations about oh this guy this new guy's in where could he go? Like that's that, that's how he and that's our shit, you know. Like, but uh, so anyone that bitches about the transfer portal, I ain't got no time for that. Like, free agency is finally here for the best sport on earth, and I I don't mean the NFL. College football is where it's at, and and we finally have a real form of free agency. Finally, a plow uh, power players and, and everything like that. So I think it's fabulous. I love it. It's Just great. Because... And I, I think what is interesting about it is that it's not like, you know, everybody says, well, it's free agency in college football. Well, maybe, but it's different in that 
there's two seasons of it. You have right now, then they have spring football. Then you have another portal season in the summer for guys. So it it's broken up a little more. It's a little more fluid, I think, in that it gives you a better chance to evaluate a good fit for you when you're making the decision. That and Great. this 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 should have been here for a long time, you know, just from the yeah. fact that let's say let's say Thor, you go back to school. You know what I'm saying? You know, you're going to go get your PhD or whatever you're going to go get. And you go into school and you can transfer as soon as you're done with your first year. That was what always bugged me. So why would we stop an athlete from doing the same thing if it's a better fit for him? You know, and that's that's what the, we've kind of limited with college football, our entire the entire existence of it. I'm glad that's finally gone because, you know, now we have this mania in front of us. It's insane. The average college football fan can't keep up with it, but it's here. It's here to stay. Thank God, finally. Yeah, yeah. I think the uh, before the 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 power and the money was centralized in uh, very small pockets. It was the you know the administrators and and the coaches, you know the institutions. I guess you know by you know a broader sense, but a lot of the, a large percentage of it was going to the coaching staffs, the administrators were. Whereas, you know, a lot of it was being generated by the players. And I, I I don't think anyone ever was saying turn college football into the NFL. But it it, it was a thing of you had this sort of uneasy thing where, you know, the, the these young athletes, are, they're generating all the money and they're not seeing any com, uh, compensation for it. But but, you know, not only that, but the, the coaches that get all the compensation, they can move freely about with no penalty. And yeah. the player, you know, you, you had these draconian rules uh, holding down their ability to transfer. You, you mentioned just like me as an example. Huseman knows this because Huseman and I have been friends since we were like fucking five years old back at Baxter Elementary. But I went to, you know, I, I graduated from Kansas, but and I started at Kansas. But I total I went to like four different colleges, you know, like, you know, in undergrad, like I, I started at Kansas and then I actually transferred back and I went to NDSU for, for one semester. I, I was in two different community colleges and then I went back to Kansas, um, you know, and that's where I was meant to be ultimately, but um, it wasn't my path to be there, you know, continuously or whatever. And it's, you know, a lot of these, these kids, it's not their path or it's not their best uh, interest. It's not their prerogative to stay at the place where they initially went. So many things can yeah. change. Uh, just one guy from this class, Matt Corral. Matt Corral signs with one uh, coach. Uh, you know, he signs with Luke. And Luke had a different uh, – who was, who, was, who was Ole Miss's offensive coordinator before they brought in Rodriguez that uh, one year when Luke was on the hot seat for Corral's first season? Um, is the guy that went to UNC, wasn't it? Oh, Longo. Yeah. So, Longo. so they had, Long so he signs with, Long cause he wants to be with Longo, right. And fucking how, well, it turns out he wanted to be with, with Longo too. Longo's a great offensive coordinator, but that's what Corral thought he was signing up for. Well then, you know, the first year he's behind, um, uh, was it behind Tom? Was, was it, was he behind Tayamo or Kelly? His first was, year. I thought it was a year after Kelly. Okay. So well, anyway, yeah, he, was behind, he was behind his first year is behind an established guy, but then, you know, yeah. he was going to take over. Well, you know, so it's so like the redshirt year and then going into his redshirt freshman year, that's when he should have taken over going forward. But Matt Luke was on, um, you know, the hot seat or whatever. Yep. So Matt Luke, um, uh, um, because he was on the hot seat, his offensive coordinator, Longo, he goes to UNC. He helps Mac Brown, his first class sign, Sam Howell. And then meanwhile, Matt Luke turns around. He's like, oh, fuck, like, who's the best offensive coordinator I can hire? And I'm trying to save my ass. Maybe I'll try to do stuff different. Um, he he hires Rich Rodriguez and ain't no one. Uh, hey, we ain't gonna we ain't gonna argue with with Rich Rodriguez. Who who's what, what's that thing that one guy in the Alabama in the SEC shorts he says about Rich Rodriguez? Um, I wake up with a cold sweat at least five times a week thinking about running the ball out of that shotgun formation. <laughs> We we love the SEC short. Yep. But you know, ain't no one gonna argue against hire and Rich Rodriguez. So they hire Rich Rodriguez. But that, you know, again, the spread option shit, that was not a fit for Matt Corral's game. You know, Matt Corral was like the one read, you know, RPO guy, throw it down field, you know, sort of a thing. And and so like for one year he's in purgatory and they end up starting uh, you know, like for that system, it was better John Reese Plumley was a better fit yeah, for John him. Reese Plumley. 
Yeah, but then the next year, Matt Luke and, and you know he gets fired, and then Rich Rodriguez. Now he's he's cast out alongside him, and then all of a sudden Longo comes in, right? And Lane Kiffin comes in, and now it's a different ball game for Matt Corral. So I, I think like, um, you know that, and and John, we were talking about this at the very beginning of this conversation to bring a full circle, just in terms of the NFL, you know the 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 fits for players and in, in specific schemes. But same thing goes for college and. Um, you have to give the players the same opportunity and the same free movement um, in the market that you give the coaches, especially if you're going to constrict their ability uh, you know, to make compensation off the money that yeah. they're, they're equally uh, generating. You just brought it full circle, Thor. Man, you just nailed it. <laughs> Time is a flat circle, as they said on – do I got an empty? Time is a flat circle. I'll do the Matthew McConaughey, like on uh, – True detective, true, de- true detective guys here. No. Well, never seen it, but I know the quote. <laughs> well, now, true detective season one. You you can end there. That's the only season you got to watch. Sure, just make sure to end there. But it, that first season, that's a good one. <laughs> Fair enough. Hey guys, I appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day to join the show and just talk some ball. Um, Thor, go ahead and plug your stuff, and then Mike, you go ahead and plug your stuff. Let everybody know where to find you. Yep. You can find me on uh, on Twitter at Thorku and uh, NBC Sports Edge is where all of our NFL draft content is. So come and come come and check us out this spring. And you can find me at Huseman CFB on Twitter as well as um, you know on if you search on the Sapient pages, you'll find me following all of them and some of my work on there. So hope to get new readers. Shout out to Huseman. Follow Huseman. <laughs> Definitely. This guy knows his stuff. Yeah. Thor yeah. knows Thor knows a lot too. So college football, NFL draft right there, transfer portal college football for Mike. Guys, again, thank you so much for coming on here, joining the show, talking some stuff. Definitely we'll we'll have to have you on longer next time, Mike. Yeah, sure. definitely. Maybe, we'll like that. Maybe yeah. like pre-plan this a little bit better because i was trying to pre-plan this with thor and he was like hey i can do it and i got 40 minutes right now i can do it if you can do it the next hour i'm like okay let's do it sure why not i'm spontaneous that's that's how it goes and i left my laptop at work even not thinking i would need it tonight so next time i'll definitely (laughs) get on that instead of my phone (laughs) yeah 100 percent. love it so yeah next time we'll have this a little bit pre-planned we'll bring both you guys on yeah we'll definitely have you on separate mic for You've got a standalone episode. I can't imagine you not being on again standalone, probably sometime closer to the draft when we have a better idea. But again, thank you guys. Appreciate you. You guys have a great rest of your night. Have fun. And uh, of course, take it easy. Don't do anything too unsafe. (laughs) Thank you.